Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back um, to our latest session, which will explore how businesses can create a sustainable supply chain and how technology and collaboration are helping to deliver those objectives. I'm Shalina Begum, Northwest Business Editor at the Business Desk, and your chair for this session. So over recent years, not only are more companies looking to improve sustainability within the supply chains, but consumers are also becoming more aware of their overall impact. Shoppers are developing more of a green attitude as a way of life and retailers need to be there to meet those needs. By implementing sustainable practices, businesses are becoming more efficient, saving money in the process and having a positive impact on their environments. To look at how they do this, we have an excellent panel today. We also encourage any questions from our audience. There's a and a button on the um, right hand corner of your um, screen. So do please ask and I will try my best to put those to the panelists. So welcome everyone. Can I just quickly go around and ask if everyone can introduce yourselves and um, Nigel, start with you first. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm Nigel Kurtz. I'm the Managing Director at LVF Packaging, based in Huntley and Leeds. Um, we manufacture plastic packaging, primarily for the food sector, um, and sustainability is something that's uh, very close to our hearts. Uh, of the uh, adverse publicity that uh, the plastic packaging has received over the last few years. Thanks, Nigel. And Gareth? Hi, I'm Gareth Kane. I've been uh, involved in sustainability for about 22 years. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've run my own sustainability consultancy, Terra Firma Limited, and I've written <coughs> five books on business and sustainability, including building a sustainable supply chain. Thanks, Gareth. And Sally. Hi, I'm Sally Wake. I'm head of um, strategic relationships at Company Shop Group. And when we started 50 years as a business, uh, 50 years ago as a business, um, stopping food, going to landfill and buying surplus uh, products. Um, we have sustainability at the heart of what we do. Um, and along with environmental and social goals, sustainability has always been a key part uh, of our business. Yeah, and that sustainability has won you your third Queen's Award for Enterprise as well, hasn't it, recently? So it congratulations has. on yeah, that. It's a community shop. Thank you very much. We are very proud. It's uh, it's amazing when you get recognised for what you do. Um, oh, well. And uh, yeah, I know the team are really, really excited, completely delighted um, to win another Queen's Award. So thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Right, um, Gareth, I'm going to come to you um, first. You know, creating a sustainable Sorry. green supply chain, you know, it's on people's agenda now. And um, tell us, why is it good for business? And why now, you know, why are people talking about it more now than ever before? Well, um, I think if you if you rewind 10 years, then most organizations looked at sustainability just within the factory fence or within the, the, uh, the office building walls. But um, I think now the responsibility, um, people expect you to be driving sustainability down through the supply chain. And it's kind of the Pandora's box of sustainability because the, the further down you go, the bigger the risks, the environmental or reputational risks you find, but also your visibility is, uh, you know, is lowest. So um, when we get these horror stories from, from around the world of things happening in, in big brand supply chains, whether it's in the, you know, clothing or, or electronics, whatever it might be. Um, it's actually quite difficult to, to know what, what your supply chain actually is. And uh, those risks can be massive. And we've seen you know, impacts on people like Apple and uh, various high street clothing brands over the years from some of these scandals coming out of the supply chain. From an environmental point of view, um, most organizations, the bulk of their environmental footprint is in the supply chain. So I do quite a lot of work with the NHS and they reckon that it's about two thirds of their carbon footprint is in the supply chain. So they're not going to meet their net zero targets without dealing with, without uh, tackling the, the supply chain head on. So it, it's, it's unavoidable these days. It seems like the bigger they are, the harder it is to get to that stage. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, um, you know, as my, my view is that uh, there, there are definitely things you could be doing. One of my uh, 
one of my clients uh, once said, um, we challenge our suppliers to fix our sustainability problems rather than us trying to fix theirs. And I think far too many people take it in the, in the second part of that. Um, and really, if you're, if you're smart about how you deal with your suppliers, you can, you can avoid a lot of these problems uh, yeah. before they even occur. And then you sort of made a point about since so the big brands, you know, they've been in the press about their supply chain and not in a good way. That's also raising awareness as well, isn't it, about it? People aren't sitting silent about it anymore. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, they, the press will go for the, the, the tall poppies. When we had the uh, the scandal over working conditions in um, in in electronics factories in in uh, China, you know those factories produce the vast bulk of all electronic products. Uh, but it was Apple who were singled out because the press know that uh, the the Apple brand will will make the headlines for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sally and Nigel, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, how are you guys incorporating sustainability into your own supply chain? And Nigel, if you want to tell me first, and yeah, I'll going to later. Okay. Um, well, first of all, but being a, as I mentioned briefly, briefly at the, the outset, being a manufacturer of plastic packaging, um, our heads firmly above the parapet at the moment, and um, I think really there was a, a huge focus of attention on, um, on littering actually uh, through David Atten. Blue Planet uh, documentary back in 2018, uh, and I think looking back on it, I think um, I think actually the focus of the documentary has been a little bit lost because it was specifically focusing on the on the shocking effects of the uh, plastic plastic littering that was having on the oceans of the world, rather than necessarily that plastic itself was a problem. Um, but nonetheless, we 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 have to constantly live with the image. Uh, being a manufacturer of plastic packaging were, were, were a problem and, and we like to see ourselves very much as part of the solution instead of part of the problem um, and so sustainability is uh, extremely important to us um, we, we we have for many many years certainly a long long time before the David Attenborough exposed, um we have used materials raw materials with, with a very high recycle content and sustainability to us really uh, I focus on the materials that we use. That we we um, we consider our um, our uh, success as being a sustainable business, being measured by how we use materials that have a very high recycle content to start with, and how we produce it that can be ready, readily recycled. And, and and I think if we tick those two boxes, there are other elements of the business that. Um, uh, where sustainability features i think that's the that's the key area for us using the right materials mm. using packaging that can be recycled and we've carried out a, a lot of work on that and and um and i think just coming back to something that gareth mentioned there it's um you the, the fact that we require recycled materials mean that our suppliers need to provide us with recycled materials and the fact that the big brand owners and retailers require their products on container recycle and be recyclable. Um, it filters all the way down the supply chain right away from the top. But I think every I think every element of the supply chain in turn is um, is supporting sustainability, either by asking its suppliers to provide it with sustainable uh, materials with high recycle contents or by producing products. Um, in accordance with the, the requirements of the brand owner and the retailer. So we all have a part to play. Mm. And one of the materials you, you use is the breakdown PET. Is it breakdown PET or breakdown PET? It, it is, yeah. It's yeah. Um, it, it's an alternative. It's only been, to be fair, it's only been very uh, lightly picked up upon. We have this kind of a catch-22 uh, position where PET is in, certainly in plastic packaging. PET is the kind of holy grail material at the moment. It's the material that has uh, that is likely to be supplied with a high recycle content. It's a material that, that can be recycled very readily, um, albeit there's way too much emphasis at the moment on recycling bottles um, because it's a good and um, 
profitable and buoyant market there and, and less so on plastic trays and pots and lids uh, but the breakdown pet is an alternative it's uh, it, it, it's not uh, it, it's not something that should be relied upon but in the hopefully unlikely event that PET isn't retitled and finds its way into landfill the the breakdown pet is an additive that um, effectively makes plastic as attractive to microbes as organic matter going into into landfill would and so rather than the plastic trays or tubs or lids or whatever it might be that produce the breakdown pet uh, sitting around in landfill for hundreds if not thousands of years they will they will break down in that kind of environment in a relatively short time frame mm. you know, more in the region of perhaps one to ten years Mm -hmm. still quite an important material isn't it and just part of the process in achieving those sustainability targets it, it is the problem at the yeah. moment is it's so much more expensive it's been very little uptake and, and, and i think what we need to find is we need to find more brand owners perhaps biting the bullet and saying well look we you know we think this would be a useful material for us to use and, and, and the economies of scale will come to bear and then it become uh, more widely accepted Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Sally, how are you guys incorporating sustainability into your own supply chain? Yeah, well, I think we always have, mm. um, to be honest. I think, um, it, as I said, it was is the heart of what we do. But I think we're widening that net. And so we are collaborating throughout industry. So working with uh, not only manufacturers and looking at their surplus, uh, but working with retailers, uh, trade bodies to get the message out there and government departments as well. Um, we find that when we work with manufacturers, um, it's a mindset change. Um, it's sort of thinking about things differently. And when we look at manufacturing sites, we do waste walks. So we look at the practices that they um, they have on site that are existing. Um, and we, we sort of notice that if you sort of, there's a black bin over there and you always put that product in there as waste because it's not quite perfect for whatever reason, although it's perfectly good to eat and in date, that, that's kind of the process that you carry on doing forever until somebody sort of says, well, actually, we could do something different with that. We could put it into a retail format, or we could put it into a different tray, or we could relabel it in some way, or you know, there's some intervention that takes place that means that that perfectly good food can go to a company shop and other organisations in order to be sold or donated, um, you know, so, so that that food isn't wasted. Um, so I think it's that sort of thing. It's trying to sort of intervene at all stages throughout the supply chain um, to change mindsets um, and working with the government we've got um, sort of surplus warriors that go on site and do this and have a look at practices um, and it's intervening early especially short data products where they haven't got enough life to go to a supermarket because they wouldn't be sold through in time it's kind of thinking well actually we have a, a huge network with our own fleet we know we can go in and, and swoop in and take a lot of product and, and move it through our supply chain through our to our members really quickly you know through the supply chain quickly so it's kind of sort of looking at intervention points um working together collaborating uh, and also education we have a luminary program um from cohort two now with people um from different uh, companies including people like coca-cola ricardo etc um, and they send people and we do sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning um, so they talk about challenges that they have throughout their business and we try and find solutions uh, together um, and they're sponsored by somebody internally at their company so they do get traction from a sponsor that's uh, typically a director um, who will help to make change. It's that desire, I think, to make a difference and make a change. Mm. But we are seeing more and more um, companies come to us to talk about uh, their sustainability. So I think that's a really good sign. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of collaboration going on. That seems Thanks. to be key, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And are you also finding, it's you know, just companies you're working for, but your end user, the people buying the products, yeah. there's an education around that as well, in that it's okay to go to the company shop and buy those products. It's absolutely definitely. fine. Definitely. Yeah, our, our members, they are quite well educated because we do a bit of a programme when they come to us um, so they understand why it's surplus. A lot of the people that are our members work in food, food manufacture. Um, so they could be one of those people on the line where an ingredient hasn't made it into the product. So they know maybe there's no, I don't know, oregano in a lasagna. I'm hoping there is oregano in a lasagna. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so whatever that might be, whatever ingredient that happens to not be there, perfectly great to eat. We just relabel that. And our members know that it'll be a, a great product but without the oregano. I'm probably just upset. <laughs> I've got loads of people now about my lack of, uh, of food knowledge. <laughs> I, 
I think I think you do use oregano and lasagna for your I, I okay. Do, but as I'm saying, I'm thinking, do you? Is that right? <laughs> um, but yeah, our members definitely, and we did um, a surplus superheroes campaign with um, all little characters, you know, um, sort of fruit, lemons, and strawberries and things uh, that weren't quite right, right for whatever reason. They were surplus, um, mm -hmm. and the children, uh, the over sixty thousand children, we educated, and they educate the parents. Mm -hmm. They will say, oh, we know why this is here. We know why that's on the shelf. We understand that. So I think the next generation, there really is an appetite to do things differently and think differently. So it's sort of getting in there early, really, and trying to uh, to change behaviours as well. Um, uh, yeah. How many tonnes of food are you guys saving from going to waste? Oh, God. Well, the sustainability report's due out in June. So I'm not going to comment until that comes out. <laughs> if that's okay <laughs> that vast amounts really but we are just um recalculating all the figures so yeah the new sustainability report will have all those details on right, um, right. but yeah it's huge amounts we have 13 company shops and six community shops um so uh, yeah it's um it's a very big number Right, brilliant. Um, this is a question for um, everyone on the panel. I mean, who do you think is driving the sustainability agenda within the supply chains? Is it people like yourself? Is it other people in the supply chain? Is it your consumers, the end users? I, uh, I, I think ordinarily you might expect that it would be the, the brand owner or the retailer that would drive it, certainly in our industry. Um, and my, my expertise really is is quite narrowly channeled into into the industry in which I operate. But, um, but it's not so unusual to find a, a brand owner or a retailer when they're specifying the packaging for their product, um, uh, uh, specifying that, that that product should contain above, uh, so that packaging sorry, should contain above a certain percentage of recycled content. Um, so in that respect, it, you think it's the it would be the brand owner or the retailer that would be dictating to the, to the manufacturer what kind of materials they're using. But increasingly, we find that the, the manufacturers themselves are driving that sustainability argument. Um, for, for, for many, many years now, uh, it's been commonplace that all of the kind of off we would refer to as the post-process waste, um, is recycled. It goes back to the manufacturers of the uh, of the raw material plastic that we use. It goes back to be be re extruded into the material to, to, to make fresh products. Um, and uh, and so there's there's been that level of system. I guess for whilst ever plastic packaging has uh, has, has been thermophobe. Um but it, it goes beyond that. You know, we we we, we as manufacturers of it, people desire. To uh, be sustainable, um, we don't need to be uh, to be guided down this particular path. I think that we, on the whole, we buy into the the, the benefits of doing so. Um, it's simply the right thing to do. When we're all said and done, as as a manufacturer, we we occupy the same world that the rest of the same planet that the rest of the uh, population occupy, and we we, we have just a, a, just as vested an interest in doing the right thing and being as sustainable as possible as uh, as the next one will have. Mm. How about yourself, guys? What do you, what would you say? It varies from sector to sector. Mm. As Michael says in uh, the sort of uh, consumer retail value chain, uh, it's it tends to be driven by the big brands. Uh, you know, Marks and Spencer see themselves as a gatekeeper for their customers that they will do the heavy lifting on sustainability so the customer doesn't have to understand that you know a zillion different issues in depth um, in other sectors it can be different i mentioned the nhs obviously they're driven by uh by government diktat um other organizations it can act, it's increasingly uh, about attracting and retaining the best talent uh because uh, potential employees are now demanding that their um, that their employer takes sustainability seriously, and that obviously um, includes the supply chain. And then for certain sectors, and we're going to see this increasingly, I think, with um, electronics and particular things like car batteries, it's going to be just security of supply. Um, you know, one of my clients is Interface, which uh, one of the most sustainable companies in the world that you've probably never heard of, uh, but they're uh, the largest carpet tile manufacturer in the world. 
um, they have decided that the only sustainable source of raw material for new carpet is old carpet. Um, so you're starting to see all these um, different forces coming into play in, in, different, um, in different sectors. And one of the things I'm always on at my clients is start with that business case, work out where the driver's coming from so that you can design your whole sustainability strategy, not just supply chain to meet those needs. And then you get the, the sort of win-win um, between your business aims and your sustainability aims. Mm, that's like the, that's the ideal world, isn't it? <laughs> we'll yeah. Hopefully yeah. get there at some point. You create yeah. that ideal yeah. world if you, if you so desire. You will. Yeah. And, and Sally yourself. Yeah, a whole range of retailers and manufacturers um, for us and trade bodies. Um, we joined up to Cortol 2025. Um, all about sustainability and working with RAP um, as well, um, who inform not only the general public on food waste um, and household waste, you know, the product waste. Um, so, yeah, for us, it's, it's, it really is everybody that we speak to has an interest. And um, I'd say that that's growing. And, and again, it shows within the, the Lumina or the educational programme that we're doing because the interest for that has been huge. And there is a big emphasis on sustainability within that. Mm -hmm. um, staying with you, Sally, I was just going to ask, um, how has the pandemic impacted the business? Because you guys have actually expanded in the last year, haven't you? And we have. Clearly a demand for what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, it's, um, it's been interesting. Like most people, it's been a challenge, what we like a challenge. Um, turning problems into potential, we would say. Um, so yeah, it's it's meant that we have expanded, but we did have expansion plans anyway. Uh, but product wise, it's meant that we've had a different range of products that have been quite challenging. Um, so things that we need to put in retail formats. So we've got a lot of hospitality products, a lot of products that were destined for schools, uh, things that maybe were supposed to be going to the foreign market that didn't make it for whatever reason. Um, so I think it's just, we never know what's coming through the door, really. You, you really are waiting for, either for somebody to make a mistake or it could be, you know, new product development and a bit more planned. But if you can't put it on a shelf and people aren't buying it in a retail space and manufacturers made it and it has a date, it needs to go somewhere. It needs to find a home. Um, so I think we've just had a different range of products and quite a lot of challenging products that have needed more intervention um but um you know that's what we're good at sort of finding solutions uh, but yeah it's, we have been opening more stores and it has been very busy i think the other side of that is that um some of our members work in uh, nhs fire police etc um and that's been very challenging and i think a lot of people that come to us um are on lower incomes and lower budgets and you pay sort of over 50 percent of a retail price so that has made us attractive for people to to come and shop uh, and want to access those, you know, good quality products at, at low prices, really. Because, like, aff affordability is key here and access, isn't it? And you know, that's what's going to drive the sustainability agenda going forward. Um, Nigel, I was going to ask you, I mean, um, you've recently invested in, is it in, in new machinery in the visit, about that's half a million yes. pounds, yeah. yeah which is, you know, really important. I mean, um, how is sort of, you know, that investment and tech playing a role in driving your green agenda? Um, well, I guess the, the, the most direct way in which it does is, is that the, the equipment is more efficient. Um, the, 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 um, the, the latest machine that we installed was a replacement for an older machine. Um, certainly the, uh, the, the level of, of efficiency on the new machine is it's far far better than the older one. The old machine, the, the machine was replaced was uh, probably 15, 16 years old, um, and um, uh, but, but there was there, there was more uh, there, there was more to it than simply replacing a, a, an old style machine with a new style machine that's a bit more efficient. The new machine that we put in has, is paired in such a way as it, it will enable us to move into like the different factory technologies. Um, uh, there's a there's a significant focus at, at, at the moment on, on reducing plastic. Um, we like to think that plastic still has a has a very important role to play. Um, but clearly, going back to the David Attenborough uh, Blue Planet program, it highlighted some misuse of plastic, some 
came out of the programme was the was the reduction in single use plastics, and, and now we're seeing um, uh, brand owners, retailers, in fact, uh, people throughout the, the chain really looking at alternative ways of packing their product. And one one area that's particularly of interest is is hybrid packaging, where where we use the plastic to only provide the the uh, the contact surface for the material, uh, so contact surface for the, the food stuff. Um, and perhaps use card to provide the structural strength and duration and the like. Um, and so the, 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 we, we, we see um, the, the advent of hybrid packaging where ordinarily the product might go into a tray that was the thickness might have been produced in five or six hundred micron BT. Um, now we'll go into a tray that's producing material that's closer to two micron, um, but it will be supported with a with, with the cardboard structure underneath, um, each of which that can be readily separated so that they can still go into their appropriate uh, recycling streams. Um, and this particular machine that we've bought is uh, is equipped to enable us to move into that market. Mm, yeah, well done, Nigel. Um, Gareth, I mean, are you seeing tech playing a bigger role in firms going green and getting the supply chain to go green as well? Um, yes and no. I think one of the one of the big issues is that um, that greener supply chains, if you want a, a radically greener supply chain rather than just a, a you know suppliers behaving a bit better, um, but if you want a radically better supply chain, um, those supply chains tend to be quite immature. So costs are high, quality is low, security of supply is poor, and one of the one of the and this something nigel said earlier was music to my ears was that they were focusing on getting recycled content into their product because that is the key creating that demand for the recycled product uh you may have seen greenpeace's recent report mm -hmm. about plastic dumped in turkey that's what happens when you try and push material for recycling that nobody wants if somebody wanted that material it wouldn't be dumped by the roadside so to create that circular economy, which is one of the, the, the best forms of a sustain, sustainable supply chain, it's all about creating that demand, whether it's uh, you know, people like Nigel uh, including recycled material into their packaging or, um, or other, you know, the other people I mentioned interface before, one of their um, sort of uh, premium products is made out of um, recycled fishing nets taken off beaches in, in in Southeast Asia, and other usually quite niche products are made of those uh, ocean plastics as well. So they're taking that very problem that David Hattenborough is uh, was highlighting it, turning it into an opportunity, and then um, getting you know the kudos as a result. Now all of that requires slightly different technology to go back to your original question than, than before but as soon as you create that demand you start to see the technology improve to meet that demand in the same way that the boom in renewable energy is you know the suddenly we have a um a much better global supply chain for solar panels and the technology will keep in improving and there's an incentive there for people to create the next generation of much more efficient solar panels and solar panels with a low impact in themselves so i see technology as a sort of um a follow-on issue from creating that demand for sustainable products or services um, uh, in the supply chains and transforming them that way if I could just jump in there, I, I have a comment to make that I think is direct. Sorry, Tali, but it's directly linked to something that Gareth, Gareth was just saying there. That um, with regard to the recycled content we're using our materials, it's important to point out that LVF packaging are no different really to the majority of other packaging um, manufacturers, certainly in the UK at least, in that we've always had a very high recycled content. Um, and what we're doing is we're striving to get a higher still recycled content. Um, the problem that we have at the moment, which ties in with something that uh, the gal has just referenced then, um, is quite a, a, a topical one. It's connected with COVID. Um, almost all of the, in fact, I would say all of the recycled content that goes into our material um, is from recycled bottles. 
Um, but as a result of the various lockdowns that have been through Europe, bottles simply haven't been finding their way into bins. No, no sport attendance at sporting events, music events, less people going to work. Uh, there's a huge shortage of bottles going into bins. In extent that some of the big bottle reprocessing plants that take the bottles, granulate them up, they wash them, they prepare them in, in uh, sorry, gra uh, they prepare the granulate in such a way that it can be used to make fresh material. Because they have such a shortage of feedstock in the bins, these sites have been closed down. And it really highlights the problem that um, the recycling infrastructure throughout Europe, but in particular in the UK, is too heavily focused on recycling bottles. Um, if it wasn't so heavily uh, focused on recycling bottles, the shortage wouldn't, wouldn't present, be presenting anything like the problem that it is. Um, and, and I think coming back to the, the, the original point about technology, how technology gets involved, I think with better sorting facilities that might require government funding, the government may need to incentivise waste recycling facilities to put the equipment in, but with better equipment, um, the, 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 the market for uh, recycled trays and pots and lids and the like to be made available for sheet extrusion again to make new packaging uh, will be enabled. But at, at the moment, um, I think the recycling uh, infrastructure uh, is to a degree taking the easy option. That there's, there's a ready-made market there for what is known as wash bottle flake, um, and they focus all their attention on that. But I think with the appropriate technologies uh, being developed, there's a whole pool of other materials that, that can be recycled and should be getting recycled to the same extent the bottles are. Mm -hmm. It's a big awareness issue around that as well, then, isn't there? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And Sally, were you going to jump in earlier? Uh, no, definitely not jumping in about technology. I think Nigel <laughs> and Gareth know an awful lot more than I do about that area. I did just want to pick up on one very quick point um, when uh, Gareth mentioned circular economy. Um, I know not directly related to us as a business, but um, having been bought by Biffa recently, I think that does give us the opportunity to look at the whole chain end to end, you know, and, and try and think of interventions at every stage. It gives us a wider opportunity and I think it'll give us a unique perspective on everything really all the way through the supply chain. So I'm quite looking forward to uh, sort of learning more and more about each aspect because otherwise I think you, you're in danger of just having a snapshot of, of your part of the world, if you like, mm, and if yeah. you can see it all the way through, I think it does help you to collaborate at every stage better, uh, which is, you know, what we're all about. Yeah, is that something that you guys are working on at the moment? It is, yeah, it is. Um, it's um, it's definitely something that, um, well, there's more opportunity across the whole supply chain, you know, because we are now part of IFA, and it's just looking at all those areas of opportunity uh, and making sure we maximise them, um, not only for commercial return, but, to, you know, for social return and to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the planet as well. Yeah. But, um, again, this is one for um, everyone on the panel. Um, how did businesses get more support and buy-in from their suppliers? Is it easier? Is it still a challenge? Is there still a, you know, still a bit more of an education awareness aspect to it that you know people aren't really looking into as much as they should be doing? Um, did I, I think from, wanna, oh, Nigel, sorry. Sorry, Gareth. No, no, Nigel. Kids are uh, I, I, I personally don't see. Um, don't see a problem in, in, in businesses to buy into sustainability. Um, from our experience, at least, um, it, 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 it's quite simply a case that uh, that we require materials that are produced in a sustainable manner, um, and therefore we will only buy materials that are produced in a sustainable manner. Um, and um, and if a material supplier can't supply that material, well, then we don't deal with them. So I think it's in in that respect, it's uh, it, it, it's fundamentally the same as uh, as most other um, um, customer supplier relationships. In that you 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 buy the product that you want, and and if the supplier sees that they are they're not not getting the sales, they will they'll be inclined to change their offering to to to, uh, to, to, to supply what the market demands. So I don't think it needs. Uh, I, I don't. I don't feel, at least, as, as though um, uh, my business uh, has to 
to uh, kind of dictate or encourage to our suppliers um, what they should be doing and, 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 and encourage them to buy into the whole sustainability um, uh, argument because I think that they, they themselves see the benefit in it as well. Mm. Oh, yes, Olga, are you seeing something similar or is different on different oh, um, sectors? No, what, what, what Nigel said, um, <laughs> you know, I couldn't say it better. But every time we make a, every time we spend some money, whether as individuals or as uh, companies or or who, whatever else, we're making a decision about sustainability effectively. So if um, if all that purchasing changes from purchasing sort of business as usual, products and services, materials, whatever it might be, to more sustainable ones, then the whole economy will change, which is what effectively we're trying to do. And, um, you know, we history is littered with uh, organisations that didn't see which way the wind was blowing at different times. Uh, when the transistor was invented, the the old uh, valve industry just died to death because they didn't they didn't see this new opportunity. Kodak famously invented digital photography, decided not to pursue it, and ended up um, losing you know one of the biggest brands of my childhood, just almost disappearing completely. So I think there's going to be a, a I sometimes say go green or go bust as all these different people who are making uh, purchasing decisions make different purchasing decisions and all those suppliers are going to have quite an existential choice to make at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, just staying with you, um, Gareth, um, you've written a book called The Green Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a smart way to invest sustainability into your organisation. I mean, how do companies go about introducing sustainability objectives into the organization and wider supply chain? Well, um, one of the things that I am very keen, the way I go about helping a client with the sustainability strategy is I don't write it. So I basically facilitate the birth of this strategy uh, by getting key decision makers to decide themselves on the targets. Uh, and what they might be. And of course, I nudge them in certain directions and make sure they cover the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a very important bit of the green jiu-jitsu side because if you tell somebody what to do, um, they tend to be resistant to that if you tell somebody to change their behavior. But if somebody decides to change the behavior themselves, then they're much more, they, they, the playing field pitches the other way. The jiu-jitsu analogy, by the way, is because I think most green communications like a, a boxer trying to beat people into submission, <laughs> whereas the, the uh, I'm not a martial artist, but they say the jiu-jitsu expert will change their technique to match the strengths and weaknesses of their opponent. So instead of coming into sustainability with a sort of what a lot of people do is sort of a watered down Greenpeace approach, uh, when I'm working in the health sector, we always emphasize the relationship between, say, climate change and health. When I'm working with engineering companies, we always look, uh, we always emphasize innovation and the thing, the problem solving and all the things that engineers value. If I'm dealing with people who are from a finance background, we make sure that we are providing them with plenty of numbers, particularly financial numbers and all. So the, the jiu jitsu thing is basically about re. Uh, reframing sustainability to match the interests of each audience and uh, as I said a big part of that is instead of me telling a, uh, a CEO that they need to embrace net zero it's uh, having a process where they decide themselves to embrace net zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nigel and Sally, Sally, I mean, what would you say to companies who are thinking about sustainability, about the supply chain and the impact on the environment? But they haven't done anything about it yet. Yeah, I think like this is what Gal said about the different industries, and um, that's really interesting because for us, it's surplus, not just food; it's all different types of surplus uh, that we purchase. So we would definitely say um, you can have a financial return, um, which is obviously a, 
well worthwhile as a business. Um, if you make a mistake, you make an error with a product, etc. Get something back for it. Don't pay to get rid of it. Do the right thing. Um, or as more and more employees, I think, are challenging within their own businesses to sort of um, challenge the companies and say, we want to do something different. We want to make a difference. Things like volunteer days and engaging with people in local communities, etc. Um, you know, do something that, that has an impact in people's lives, make a difference. So something like community shop where people's lives can be changed with surplus food. Um, so I, for me, I would say look at the the end result of what you're doing look at the benefit to you as a business and i agree if you if you kind of we try and work with businesses as to what works for them because they are all unique and they are all driven by different different things um so you know it might be a financial return it might be a social impact it might be a combination of the two but find out what works for you and just just think about how you can do it differently and talk to those people that are doing it day to day at all levels because it's kind of top down and bottom up approach everybody has to be engaged in that process yeah, can't work the, in isolation yeah and the impact it has on your staff and employees as well there's that it, it's huge yeah, yeah huge yeah. And, and they feel like they're part of something and part of a change movement and part of a solution um which is all hugely important for for helping it to land as opposed to just sort of saying the right thing it's actually saying it and doing it and wanting to do it and wanting to make it different and wanting to make a change and understanding why you're doing that yeah thanks sally and nigel um, I believe the question was with regard to how to encourage people to buy into sustainability. Um, my my advice would be to a business that doesn't believe that is in any way um, aligned with sustainability principles. Something very quick, quick and simple and easy to do and see the benefit through virtually no cost. So, for example, we we began to recycle by by finding a local recycler. We began to recycle the plastic wrapping that, that protects the rolls of plastic whilst they're in transit to us, and all the pallet wrapping that uh, the stretch wrap and cling film that comes into the building. We began to recycle that um, uh, about a year ago now. Um, uh, along with the cardboard that used to find its way into our normal waste skin. Um, uh, and a very, very quick result was that we we now pay for our waste skin to be emptied. Um, uh, it happens a third as often as it used to do, I'm trying to say. Uh, and that's just by deciding not to put something that we always, always considered to be rubbish into a rubbish bin. Instead, we said, no, it's, it, it can be recycled. Tiny amount of effort. There was an, a little bit of initial kickback that someone had to be detailed. We had to, we had to source a baler to bale the material. Somebody had to be detailed to go and put the material in the baler. Within a few weeks of doing so, it became just part and parcel of everyday life on the shop floor. The, the guys on the shop floor saw a positive benefit they didn't have to walk out to the skip in the yard where it was quite often wet and rainy. They would take the material and put it in the baler indoors instead. And so they thought, this is a good idea. Um, and uh, and we now sell that material. Um, so there's a there's a, a benefit in terms of uh, income to the business. Um, the guys on the shop floor think it's a, a, a agree that it's a good thing that they're doing. And it's quick and simple to do. And and, and I think that, okay, that's not going to change the world. But if it, if it, if it brings some business, some businesses into the sustainability drive who are not already there, it's a quick and easy way of doing it, and, and very quickly it will escalate to, to to bigger and more meaningful measures. Mm. Yes, like small steps at a time, and it'll make a big difference. Um, that's all we've got um, time for now, and thank you so much for. Um, your input and your insights. And um, as Gareth said, go green or go bust. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.